Well, good afternoon and welcome to another teaching. It is a Sunday afternoon here in Texas and hopefully y'all are just loving on Jesus, spending time with Jesus, growing to know Jesus. As we say every time, there's nothing more beneficial or edifying in our lives than spending time with Jesus, spending time in prayer, spending time in thanksgiving, just thanking him for all the goodness and favor and blessings on your life, spending time in praise and worship, spending time in fellowship with other believers, um, but above all, spending time in the scriptures, in the word of God, spending time in your Bible is the greatest way to grow to know Jesus. As you grow to know his word, study the scriptures, meditate on the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, but above all, obey the scriptures, right? And for us to repent where we fall short. So this is how we grow to know Jesus and grow to walk with him more intimately. And as we grow to walk with him more intimately, the whole, the whole relationship becomes more energized, more exciting, and more fulfilling. And it, and, it, and it builds on itself. It compounds, right? And we just want to know Jesus more. And we want to just spend more time with him. And it, and it gets more and more exciting. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, last time we... Uh, you know, we got through about, you know, seven, eight verses or so of, uh, of John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, he is in prison, as we said. And, um, you know, Jesus is, is doing immense, tremendous miracles. He's, he's healing deaf people. He's healing blind people. He's curing sicknesses and diseases. He's raising dead people. Um, there's immense blessings going out everywhere. And yet, you know, John has just been left in prison. He's been unjustly arrested. He's left in prison and Jesus is not, is not doing anything to get him out. And, uh, and you know, John doesn't understand it. Um, John had, you know, had proclaimed Jesus as the savior of the world, right? John said he was not worthy to untie the strap on Jesus's sandals. Um, but, you know, John served him. By Jesus' own words, there had never been anyone born of woman that's greater than John, which is to say there has never been a better man than John the Baptist. And yet Jesus is, is giving blessings to, to countless people, healings and deliverance, but yet he's letting John stay in prison. Um, and so John is having some doubts, and we had talked about that last time, and it's, you know, it was difficult, you know, for him. And we can all we can all recognize in our own lives, right? When, when Jesus just allows us to go through trouble and hardship and, um, and difficulty and pain and, you know, we're looking for his deliverance, right? But it often doesn't come in, in the time that we expect, right? And that, uh, that can be hard, right? And sometimes it can cause doubts in our, in our own hearts, um, you know, and not, not doubts that, that, that Jesus is the savior and he's the son of God, but it just, you know, it just causes us to, to be frustrated and disappointed and, uh, and sad and angry oftentimes. Right. So Jesus, you know, sends John's messengers back. Uh, John asks Jesus the question, you know, should we, you know, in verse Eight in verse 19, he sends two of his own disciples and says, go to Jesus and ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? And basically John's saying, I mean, you're the savior, you're the Messiah, you're taking care of everyone else, but here you are just leaving me unjustly in prison, right? So John's two disciples go to Jesus um, and they ask him the question. Jesus doesn't give him an answer. Jesus says in verse 22, so he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So um, Jesus doesn't answer John's questions. Of course, he is the Messiah, but Jesus wants John just to rely on the facts. So Jesus tells John's disciples, Go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. Go back and tell John that you've seen me, right? Uh, heal blind people of their blindness. Go back and tell them you've seen me heal the lame and they're walking. Go back and tell John that you've seen me 
heal those with leprosy and they're cured. Go back and tell John that deaf people are hearing, blind people are seeing, and the dead are raised. And that the good news is preached to those who are poor and poor in spirit and understand their spiritual poverty and are willing to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus doesn't assure John by his words. He assures him by what he is doing, right? And so John's disciples go back. Jesus also tells them to tell John, blessed is the man, verse 23, who does not fall away on account of me, which is to say, you know, you know, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes we can, we can be frustrated and we can fall away and we can get very irritated with Jesus, right? When things don't happen in the way we, we thought they should, or in the time we thought they should, right? Um, and so Jesus says, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me, on account of what Jesus has or has not done in your life, right? The, the, the foundation for every human being in the world is we need Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul, right? Um, all of us need him and we can never fall away from that. So um, now we'll pick up in verse 24. And it's very interesting. It says here, and we'll read 24 to 35. It says, after John's messengers had left, Luke 7, 24, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, we'll stop there for now and then we'll pick up and do... 29 to, to 35 here when we're finishing up. So, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for our Bible, Father. We thank you that we have the living word of God to feed our spirit and feed our soul. But, Father, above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life for us. We thank you for dying a perfect, torturous death for us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and risen today and we worship you. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to lead us and guide us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. So verse 24, with that backdrop... After John's messengers left. Now, this is a this is this is an extremely important aspect of this story. Try to follow this, right, Alicia? After John's messengers left. So remember, John is in prison. He's 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 struggling. He has doubts, he has concerns, he has fears. Jesus is helping everybody else, but he's not delivering John, and no one has served Jesus like John. Um, and John simply goes back. Uh, Jesus simply tells John's d disciples to go back and tell him of all the miraculous, supernatural things Jesus is doing and of the incredible love that's being shown to those who are poor and understand their, their spiritual poverty, right? Um, but it says, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. So now the messengers don't hear this part. And how, how just amazing it would have been, how nice it would have been if the messengers could have stayed for this part. But Jesus intentionally allows or sends John's messengers back to John before he says these incredibly complimentary things about John. Things that he didn't say about anyone else, right? And how nice it would have been if the if John's messengers could have went back to him in jail and said, you know, listen, Jesus didn't didn't answer the question, 
but he simply told us to report to you, John, all that we saw him saying and doing. And certainly we did see with our own eyes him hearing deaf, healing deaf people. We saw him giving blind people their sight. We saw people with leprosy and we saw him cure them. You know, we saw dead people being raised from the dead and we saw just just the poor those, you know, the spiritually poor, the, the hungry people just really receiving the good news about Jesus. Um, and so they go back and tell John that. But how nice would it have been if they could have also heard Jesus say these things, starting in verse 24, Jesus speaking to the crowds. What did you go out in the desert to see? All right. After John's messengers left, after they left. Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind. 25. If not, what did you go out to see? So number one, a reed swayed by the wind. Okay. Um, there is really few things that Jesus has less taste for than, than just someone who's lukewarm and swayed this way or that way in just every every whim of religion, right? Um, if you turn to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible in chapter three, um, you're gonna see when he's talking to the, the, the seventh church of Laodicea um, and, you know, and he's speaking to a church here and this is the seventh church. And he says in verse 15, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now he's speaking to the church here. And for the most part, for the most part, this is the modern day church where we have become very much a lukewarm church, a reed swayed by the wind, right? Um, we're not hot. We're not cold. We're just going along our way. We go to church on Sunday and we believe we've done our duty, but there's no zeal for Jesus. There's no passion for Jesus. There's no fervor for Jesus. We're caught up in our own lives, um, you know. We have very little interest in the kingdom of God and the gospel of God and in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he says, when you're talking about John the Baptist, what did you go out to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Um, he says, no. Then verse 26, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. And those are some serious words. More than a prophet more than Elijah, more than Jeremiah, more than Ezekiel, uh, more than Isaiah, more than Daniel. Um, so again, he is speaking about John in such a profound way. And number one, John was not a reed swayed by the wind. John the Baptist firmly stood in the word of God. He firmly stood for Jesus. He stood up for the truth of the word of God and didn't back down in, in the face of religious persecution. And that's why he's in jail now for speaking the truth to King Herod, that it wasn't lawful for him to, to be sleeping with his brother Philip's wife. And so he was arrested, right? And put in jail. So John the Baptist was not a reed swayed by the wind. Verse 25, if not, what did you go out to see a man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. John the Baptist wasn't concerned about his outward appearance. Now, listen, this really does apply more to us now than it ever has, right? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes. As Christians, um, there is so much emphasis put. Now, listen, it's fine for a pastor to wear a, a suit and to dress nice, um, and to be presentable. Okay, that's a good thing. I undoubtedly need to do a better job in that. Um, I'm more casual. But oftentimes, and this is just, this is throughout the church, 
the majority of the church is more concerned with what they look like on the outside than how they really are doing on the inside. Right, Corinne? Meaning, again, we ought to be presentable. We shouldn't go to, you know, go to church just, you know, like an unmade bed with our hair messed up and, you know, face dirty and all that stuff. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not about wearing fine clothes and nice jewelry and having perfect hair and having our everything done perfectly. OK, so Jesus said, if not, what did you go out to see a man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. And again, that's the v vast majority of us in the Western church. Our homes are like palaces. We do, again, often have our identity in expensive clothes, and we certainly indulge in luxury. John the Baptist didn't do any of this. John the Baptist had a simple life, okay? And his heart was about proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. John the Baptist is an example to all of us, okay? Now listen, what am I saying? It's fine that we have a nice home. OK, it's fine that we have a car. It's fine that we have nice clothes. The issue is that we have we put far more emphasis on those things than we do on our relationship and walk with Jesus. Excuse me. And it's just a, an absolute area of repentance for the entire Western church. Father, I do ask you to forgive us. I ask you to forgive me. Father, I thank you that I certainly have a nice home and, you know, Lord, I do think even the clothes I'm wearing are nice clothes, although I don't, you know, I don't have a great wardrobe, Father, but Lord, I, I just have so much luxury, there are no words for it. I ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of unrighteousness, Lord. Cleanse us in the body of Christ of having our identity in just in our possessions and in our outward appearance, Lord. Drive us to you, Lord Jesus. Forgive us and cleanse us. Holy Spirit, lead us and help us to see Jesus. Mm. Help us to be like John the Baptist. Verse 26, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Now, again, those words, wow. You see that, Uncle Dennis? Yes, more than a prophet. Think of all the prophets in the Old Testament. Again, think of Moses. Think of Abraham. Think of Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel, right? The thick, thick books of the Old Testament, right? Think of Daniel. Think of Noah. Think of, uh, you know, Joseph. You know, think of, uh, uh, you know, Gideon, um, David, you know, Daniel. I already said that. Uh, Malachi, just all these, these great men of God and prophets of God. And yet he says John the Baptist is more than a prophet. Jesus' own words, verse 27, this is the one about whom it is written, and Jesus quotes the scripture here about John, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And when you look at that, that's Malachi 3, verse 1. So the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, right, prophesied in chapter 3, verse 1, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And again, so the Old Testament prophet Malachi predicted that John the Baptist will be the messenger to prepare the way for Jesus. So let's listen to how incredible this man is. But the messengers don't get to hear any of this. Wouldn't it have been nice if the messengers still could have been there to hear this, right? Does that make sense, Esther? Does that make sense, you know, Peyton? Meaning if... The messengers are able to hear this as well. They can go back and proclaim to John all the things and miracles they had seen Jesus do. But then they also could have said, man, John, do you know what he said about you? He said you were more than a prophet. He said you weren't swayed back and forth by what, what people think and by religious leaders. That You stuck to the word of God. Um, he said that you weren't a man that was given over to luxury and self-indulgence and fine clothes. Um I mean, John, he spoke about you like, like, like no one has ever been spoken about. And then in verse 28, look what Jesus says. Now, it is notable that Jesus quotes the scripture. You notice that Jesus holds the Old Testament, David, um, as the word of God. In verse 27, 
you know, Jesus quotes the Old Testament as the word of God. Jesus is consistently quoting the scriptures as the word of God, which is, of course, they are, right? But look at verse 28. This is what Jesus concludes about John the Baptist. Verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Wow. He just said that, Scott. Listen to those words. Out of Jesus' mouth, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. So that just meant all the incredible men and women of God of the Old Testament, none greater than this guy right here. None more godly than this man right here. None with a heart to serve Jesus more than this man right here. Right? Wouldn't it have been nice, I'll say it again, John being in prison, he's struggling. Why is Jesus letting me suffer like this? Why is he not delivering me when everyone else is getting blessed and everyone else is getting helped? Um, and, uh, you know, and yet John's disciples don't hear any of this because if they did, they would be able to go back to, uh, they'd be able to go back to, to John and say, man, he said all these things about you. And John, do you know the last thing he said about you? Jesus said about you, John, that he actually made this statement that of those born of women, there is no one greater than you. And how comforting that would have been to John, how encouraging that would have been to John. But they don't hear that part of it. They don't get to report that part of it. Now, why does Jesus do this? Why is sometimes everybody getting blessed, but Jesus is, is just, just allowing us to go through difficulty and suffering and trial and waiting and difficulty with health or difficulty in relationships or difficulty in finances, right? Just emotionally down, depressed, sad and you know, John is in prison and he's having doubts. And how often have we been in an emotional prison or a financial prison, right? Or, you know, and just uh, just down or we've just been just imprisoned by bad health and sadness and not feeling good. And he just and he just doesn't move in the way we want or in the times we want or in the manner we want. It's just. Uh, I don't know, it's just so difficult, right? But John does not get to hear this. And why is that? It's it's clear he he didn't need it, right? It's now, and now again, now what's encouraging to this at some level, right, is that here is here's a man that Jesus said there's never been one greater than this guy, and yet he's having struggles, he's having some doubts, he has some, you know, he's just having his own frustrations and disappointments and sadness, right? And so we can all relate to that, right? As I said last time, uh, Dave Anderson, you know, who's, uh, you know, a leader in this ministry and helps to write the exhortations and really taught me how to write, um, you know, you know, he's always said it's only madmen that never have doubts. Right. Does that make sense? Like, you know, uh, a madman like, say, Hitler, who just, you know, thinks that he's, you know, he never doubts his 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 plan. Right. It's, you know, that, you know, as as people. Obviously, we hang on to the truth that Jesus is Lord, right? And absolutely. But none of us are perfect. All of us struggle at times with disappointment and sadness and doubt, right? Um, and we just repent over it, right? Father, I ask you to forgive us for our, our doubts and our frustrations and our irritations and our disappointments. Help us, Father, to, to trust in you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to trust in you. So look what Jesus says at the back end of this statement, though, in verse 28. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's just an interesting statement Jesus put in. What is he talking about there? You know, um, I mean, what is he saying here? Of those born of women, there's not one greater than John, yet the one who's least in the kingdom of God. You got to go to heaven to find someone greater than John. What Jesus is saying here is that when he says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, John the Baptist was in, you know, was under the Old Testament. He was under the Old Covenant, okay? In the New Covenant, right, in the, in the, in the time that we live in in the church, in the, in the covenant 
of God's grace, right? And the covenant of, you know, just living where we live in the age where Christ has come. He's given his life on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. And when we, when we, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Jesus actually comes to live inside of us. If you're a genuine Christian today, if you're genuinely trusting and relying on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul, um, Jesus lives in you. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is one with your spirit. He's regenerated you. You have eternal life. You have spiritual life. And you're, you actually have Jesus living in you. And with Jesus living in you, you, in that manner, you are greater than any person that lived in the entire Old Testament because Christ is actually living in us. The Spirit of God is living in us. And that was not the case with all the people who lived before the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, right? So when he says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, it's not that any of our character is by any means greater than John the Baptist, but by the very fact that the Son of God, Jesus, lives in us and we're one with Jesus, we're married to Jesus, we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? We're the body of Christ. We're the bo- the bride of Christ. And the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is one with our spirit, right? In that manner, we're greater than any human being that has ever lived without that. So hopefully that makes sense. That's what he's saying when he says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God, the one who lives on this side, right, of the new covenant, right? And 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 all the incredible blessings of having Jesus be one with us and living inside of us, right? What is it? Colossians 127, Christ in you, the hope of glory. They didn't have that, right? That didn't come until after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, you were still saved in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you would put your faith in the word of God and the Savior that was to come. The, the, the scripture had 300 plus prophecies that a Messiah would come, a Savior would come, right? And so you would put your faith and trust in the Messiah, the Savior that was to come. You looked forward to the Savior, right? You looked forward to the cross, so to speak. You and I have put our faith and trust and reliance in the Savior or the Messiah that has come, right? We look back to the cross, and put our trust in Jesus who died and rose again 2,000 years ago. So the same cross, the same Savior, the same Jesus saves us all, right? It's incredible. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, 29 through 35. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. So what does this mean? All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus's words, 29, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. So all the people that were willing to go to John the Baptist, remember, John the Baptist was baptizing people into what was called a baptism of repentance, meaning you would go to John, you would acknowledge that you had been living a sinful lifestyle in whatever ways it was, right? And all of us have sinned. And in that acknowledgement, in that humility, John the Baptist would, would baptize you, right? And it was a baptism of repentance, right? It would, it would signify that, you know what, you were repentant of your sin and you went into the waters and it, and it was a, and it was a washing of the sin. Now this was not salvation. Um, we're, we're not saved by feeling sorry for our sins. We're not saved by acknowledging our sins in order to be saved. We do need to humble ourselves. We do need to acknowledge that we are sinful people and that our only hope is in receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? John 1.12 says that to all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you trusting and relying on him alone today for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul? Or, or do you simply have a, a, an intellectual belief 
that, yeah, Jesus Christ existed, right? You're not sure. I mean, Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, hear me. It's not our words that save us, right? We just don't puppet words and we get saved. It's Christ that saves us. But we communicate our heart, right? We use our words to communicate our heart. So if you're not sure, just just go before Jesus and call out to him. Genuinely and humbly acknowledge your sin before him and simply pray, Lord Jesus, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong, Lord Jesus, and I know that I am hopeless and helpless and desperate without you. And I know only hell awaits me, Lord. But Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you came into this world and I believe you lived a perfect righteous life for me. And I believe you died a perfect righteous death for me. And Lord Jesus, I believe you are alive and risen today. And therefore, Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come into my heart and to be the Lord of my life and to save me from my sin and to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all my faith, my hope, my trust, and my confidence in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God, right? Now, now again, that's, that's, that's how you, you call on Christ. And, and if you're not sure, rewind the tape. Use the words I used. But again, it's the genuineness of your heart, the sincerity of your heart that matters and humbling yourself before Jesus and receiving him knowing your desperate need of him and that without him only hell awaits. In John 14, 6, Jesus said of his own words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? Those are his own words. So when, when Jesus says, you know, um, when they heard Jesus's words, they acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John, meaning they acknowledged that God's way was right and their own way was wrong. My way, my way of living, my way of thinking is wrong. And they went before John the Baptist, acknowledged their sinfulness in their actions and in their thinking. And, and because of that, because of that humility, when they heard Jesus's words, it made sense to them. They were convicted by that, right? But look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Now hear this, and this spirit is alive and well in the church today. So the Pharisees and experts in the law were the, the big revered pastors and teachers and elders of Jesus's day. But they were not willing to acknowledge their sinfulness. They were not willing to go to John the Baptist and be baptized by him because they were the ones everybody was looking to. They were the big shots. They were the mega pastors. They were the ones that everyone went to for advice. Now, hear me. Just because you're a mega pastor of a big church doesn't make you unwilling to listen. But it is hard, right? The more notoriety we get, the more people say, yes, pastor, yes, pastor, yes, pastor. Although I do like it when folks say that. I just want people to say, yes, sir. But, and you know, that's my own issue, right? But, um, you know, the more that happens, the more we can think that we have this figured out, right? The Pharisees believe John should be listening to them. But it's interesting how throughout the scriptures, and this is true in the world today, oftentimes the Lord will consistently raise up men and women that are not part of the big religious establishment. And like John the Baptist, they'll hold to the word of God. They'll hold to Jesus, right? But some of the most mature and devout and serious Christians you'll ever meet oftentimes won't be in church, but they'll have a heart for Jesus and a love for Jesus and a knowledge for Jesus like few you've ever seen in church. Now listen to me, what am I saying? It's good to go to church. You want to be in a good, solid, Bible-based church. But again, uh, going to church in itself does not give you a heart for Jesus. Going to church is a good thing, but that ought to be about 5% of your overall walk with Jesus what you do the other seven days you're not in church and growing to know Jesus and growing to love him and growing to walk with him, that's what's important. So, but the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they refused to be baptized by John. So they refused to acknowledge their sinfulness. So they didn't understand their need of Jesus. 
until we acknowledge and understand that every human being, all 8 billion people in the world are desperately sinful, all of us need a savior, and our only hope of escaping eternal hell is Jesus Christ. Until we know that, right? It's hard to run to Jesus until you know your need of him. Romans 3.23 says that every single human being is sinful and falls short of God's holy standard. None of us does what's right, right? All right, verse 31. Jesus speaking, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? And this is interesting because Jesus could say today, what could he compare the people of this generation? And it's really not much different, right? Verse 32. They're like children. Now, number one, it's not a, you know, it's not a compliment because he's just speaking here. Um, and, you know, he's speaking about like the religious leaders, like the people who are supposed to know the most about Jesus in the land. And he says they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. So it's like children. Children who are dancing around and you can't please them, right? What he's saying is that no matter what John did or no matter what he said, and Jesus is saying, no matter what I do, this generation is not pleased. They All they do is find a reason to be dissatisfied. And you know, and sometimes we do too much of that as Christians, right? Obviously, there are things that need to be corrected in the church, but we need to be looking at ourselves first, right? There's a million, there, there are countless things I need to do better. And I need to look at myself, right? Um, you know, if we're just, if all we ever do is talk about what's wrong with churches or ministries, then that's a problem, okay? We need to be doing our part in the body of Christ, right? And building up the church. Now, again, at the same time, it doesn't mean we're not going to acknowledge the things that are out of place, again, in our own lives first, then in the church, right? We're always going to want to make things better. But again, you want to do it with the right heart, with the right spirit, and a desire for Jesus to be glorified. What, are this, what is a generation like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't cry. You just, you didn't respond the way we want you to. We're not, you know, you didn't, you know, like a kid who plays the flute for you. And, but you don't dance the way the kid wants you to dance. So the kid is mad. That's how they are in this generation, and often that's how we are in the church today. If the pastor or I don't say things just as you want me to or just as I like you to, sometimes you get bad, right? Excuse, forgive us, Lord. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. So, you know, you don't, you know, often, you know, the, the, the people, you know, look at verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. Okay, it's ridiculous. John the Baptist was not someone who was a glutton by any means. He didn't, he didn't eat fine foods. He didn't indulge in luxury. He didn't even drink. And they say he had a demon, right? It's just ridiculous because again, they did not like John's message. They weren't satisfied with him. So they found ways to be satisfied like children. They couldn't be pleased, right? Verse 34, Jesus speaking about himself. The son of man came eating and drinking. And you say he is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Just ridiculous, right? This is Jesus now, and they're calling Jesus a drunkard, a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. All of that is just ridiculous, right? Jesus was willing to be around tax collectors and sinners to win them to Christ, right? But he was by no means like them. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. And yet they found ways to discredit Jesus, they found ways to not like his ministry. They found ways to be like John. Uh, they found ways to dislike John and to not like his ministry. And Jesus said, what can I compare to generation? It's the same with our generation. They're like children calling out to each other. Hey, we played the fruit for you and you didn't dance. Jesus, John, you didn't dance to our tune or what we wanted, right? Um, we sang a dirge. You didn't cry, right? Does it make sense, right, what Jesus is saying here? We were doing this in Bible study yesterday with my daughter Kristen and Lauren, and it was a little hard for them, but hopefully that makes sense. I mean, they just, no matter what, they found reasons to not want to listen to John and Jesus. And, and, and that's what we'll do often in the world today is we just, we don't want to hear. We'll find every problem with the pastor, and certainly I have, I got plenty of my own, but it's the word of God. These, this is the truth, right? We got to stop finding reasons why we don't believe the Bible, why we don't believe Jesus. It's the word of God. It's the truth. 
verse 35, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. So Jesus ends it by saying, listen, wisdom is proved by your actions, by what it produces, right? Uh, the word of God and the wisdom of God produces wise children of God that follow Jesus, that love Jesus, that want to know Jesus, that advance the, that, that have a heart for the advancement of the kingdom of God and the gospel of God. Jesus says, but wisdom is proved right by all her children, right? Genuine wisdom will always be proved right. The wisdom of the scriptures, the wisdom of the gospels, the wisdom of our Bible is always proved right by what it produces, right? So instead of us consistently wanting to find loopholes, right, Jack? Um, let's just give ourselves to the scriptures, right, Rap? Becky, let's give ourselves to the scriptures. Cash, give yourself to the scriptures because wisdom is proved right by your children, by its actions, by what it produces in us. Mm. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our Bible. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, and your goodness in our lives. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that we have our Bible. We thank you, Father, that we have the Holy Bible that we can read and study, Lord, and learn from and chew on and feed our spirit and soul. Father, we do ask you to forgive us just where, where we have been like children, Lord, where I have, Lord, and I'm just... I'm just, you know, where there's aspects where I'm just dissatisfied. Forgive me where I've had doubts and frustrations, Lord, for, for you are the son of God, Lord Jesus. And we know that and we thank you for it. Forgive us, Father, where we're hypocrites like the Pharisees and experts in the law, where we, we are unwilling to repent. Help us to have repentant hearts, Holy Spirit. Convict us that we would have repentant hearts and help us to... Uh, just to, to, just to follow the wisdom of the Word of God and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus, we worship you and we thank you today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this message to our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.